2009, the promotion of renewables was a crucial part of a strategy towards um, a low carbon economy. Uh, and this requires support to a number of new technologies, at least new technologies in application, if not in, in, uh, in uh, original uh, basic technology. So whether it's wind, solar, wind offshore, onshore, solar voltaic, solar thermal, um, bioenergy in the first generation, bioenergy in the second generation, uh, we uh, recognized then in 2009 that it was necessary to start developing these technologies if we we're going to meet uh, emissions objectives. Um, by the way, renewables not just don't just contribute to sustainability of the way in which we produce energy, but they also um, allow us to reduce uh, considerably the dependency of Europe on uh, fossil uh, fuels uh, from outside the European Union, something which is not said very often in public, but I'd just like to repeat that. It is a crucial element of this strategy. Now, a lot of people have examined our recent documents and looked at the 2020, uh, the, the, our, our new 2020 strategy for energy policy and said, well, the number of times you mention renewables isn't enough. I just want to point out that uh, both in the infrastructure package, which we published uh, in, in uh, November, and in the latest communication on renewables, we renew the commitment to renewables. We stress how important it is to uh, develop um, the infrastructures needed to integrate those renewables into the, the grids of Europe. And um, we also stress the importance of balancing out variable sources of e e electricity with other sources in order to optimize uh, Europeans' delivery of, uh, Europe's delivery of, of electricity in particular. And there, it's quite clear that um, uh, renewables will represent, they will represent in 2020 uh, about a third of all electricity generation. And if we're to meet the 80 to 95 percent objective of, of reduction in emissions in 2050, then the percentage of renewables will be significantly higher than that uh, in the road towards 2050. More, more it, than 60 percent? More than 60 percent, as George <laughs> says. He's got all the figures in the back of his head. He invented them. Now, uh, I want to want to say that, uh, as Claude has mentioned, we, we've we've had the plans of the member states, uh, uh, which are designed to show how they will uh, achieve the um, their, in principle, binding targets for percentage of renewables as part of energy consumption. As you know, they differ in their ambition from country to country. Um, as uh, mentioned by Claude, we've got three countries which, not only for reasons of climate change policy, but also in terms of developing a competitive technology, have gone much further than other countries, Denmark, Spain, um, Germany. There are other countries, too, who have a very strong proportion of, of biomass and bioenergy in their, in their proposed mix. And overall, it looks as if um, uh, there will be attainment of that 20% uh, target. Now, of course, these targets, uh, are they market-driven or are they policy-driven? I think the fact is that they're both, really. Um, uh, you can't say that immediately uh, all companies, energy companies in the, in the European Union or all potential new entrants are under some obligations to it. The obligations are on the member states to ensure that systems are in place. And of course that's led to a lot of debate because uh, you know really the four hurdles which all these competitive technologies need to meet. They need to be technology, technologically robust. Can we depend on them? They need to be commercially viable. That is, at some point, these technologies must deliver um, energy at grid parity. However, in a world in which we've internalized external costs of emissions. Thirdly, they've, they've got to be capable of being, in the meantime, supported by national budgets. 
without excessive subsidy in relation to what, what's going on. And fourthly, um, well, the public has got to accept some of the, um, the, um, the, the, the construction of infrastructures uh, for generation and for transport, which are necessary to integrate renewables. That's not evident. Uh, however, it isn't any more evident for CCS technologies or for nuclear. <coughs> All these technologies are subject effectively to these four thresholds. Now, the electricity industry keeps saying to us, um, as Claude has said, that um, the, the, the playing field is being uh, un tipped unevenly by all these subsidies. Um, and um, uh, and uh, you know, if, if, if we really wanted to go to an emissions-free economy, all we have to do is to raise the price of carbon. Well, I think that's a flawed argument because uh, without new technologies, it's not possible to get there. So the, the, comp the competition was already distorted by the lack of internalization of the external costs of, um, of emissions in the, in the electricity markets. There is, therefore, it's completely natural that there should be effectively what is a bet by European countries that some of these technologies will reach the thresholds needed in order to provide us with viable energy. And that's the basis upon which we support um, uh, what's going on and we give an extra drive to that. I wouldn't say entirely that uh, there isn't a need to um, find some, harm, some, some degree of harmonization uh, in support for renewables as time goes on across the European Union. Because the more our grids are interconnected, the more a fantasy it is to suppose that national support schemes are only for the benefit of national, uh, national markets. This is patently not true, just as much as it's not true that Austrian consumers don't uh, consume nuclear energy. They do already today. Um, they do it because the NBW is supplying um, energy into Austria. But no one talks about it, but I'm just telling you what is the reality. Now, the open market, the open competitive integrated market in Europe is a vital element in ensuring the future of renewables because if we can make sure that the grids are open for uh, new entrants, we're actually guaranteeing too that new entrants uh, based upon renewables can, um, can, uh, can develop markets uh, often in, with, uh, consi in considerable, under considerable pressure from the incumbents. Now, is there a financing renewables gap? Well, I think that the, the fundamental message we receive from, from the financial institutions is predictability. Give us a framework for investment which gives us some guarantee not that you will always subsidize at the same rate um, uh, the feed in the, the tariffs for, um, for renewables, but that you will actually guarantee us that when we make our investment, we are making it knowing that we can dimension the risks in a, in a reasonable way. So there's been a lot of legitimate criticism in our view of those countries who've decided to change retroactively the schemes. Um, that's no good. And it's also no good if every government which comes in changes the regime every two or three years. We've got to have some kind of framework which uh, allows, this, allows support to go on. But at the same time, on the on private side, it's got to be recognized, um, the bet on new technologies is that you'll come down the cost curve as you roll out, roll out the, 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 uh, the um, generation capacity and use it effectively, and costs should come down, as they are coming down in, in wind in particular, and also in some, uh, to a large extent, in solar. Yeah.